friends that have invested in my life. He's not, he'll come up. He's not a great man, but he serves a great God. But he, he's a man who loves God, loves his wife, loves his kids, loves his family, loves the church. But he loves God more than anything else. Let's give a warm welcome as Pastor Bill Kerr comes to lead us today. Don't you love your pastor? How many of you thank God for your pastor, huh? God is good. So glad to hear you say that. Never been introduced as here's a friend that's not great. I love that. That's good. Well, I mean it. That's good. The, the day of superstar preacher and hero worship is over. Jesus is the Lord. Hello, Jesus. We're here to give God the glory. Here to give the, give the credit. Jesus, the Lord said, I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory will I not give to another. Neither my praise to graven images. It's amazing what God will do when no one cares who gets the credit. It's amazing what God will do when no one else gets in the way. It's amazing what God will do when we let the Lord do what he wants to do. It's amazing what God. When John Brown was the governor, he thought he was great. John Brown was the governor of Kentucky. He, he spoke at a local high school assembly. And after the true story, and after he spoke, the principal of the high school said, would you like to have lunch with the students? And John Brown said, sure. So he walked through the cafeteria line in Kentucky, and as the girl put a piece of chicken on and a scoop of vegetables and a roll on his plate, the governor said, I'd like to have two pieces of chicken, please. She said, uh, I'm sorry, everybody gets one piece of chicken. He said, do you know who I am? She said, no. He said, I'm the governor of Kentucky. She said, do you know who I am? <laughs> he said, no. She said, I'm the girl that passes out the chicken, and you get one piece, mister, and one piece of chicken. How many of you know God is the great one? God is the great one. We love what God is doing at ICC. We really, really do. If you have your scripture today from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, whatever version. I am so excited. I am so excited about this. I, I, did I hear correctly that, like, the next time I visit, like, I can actually preach the 12 o'clock service in jeans and, like, a non-tie shirt? How many of you believe God could even be in that? Hello? Could God be in that? <laughs> Two weeks ago, Wednesday night, I was with about 500 young people. They told me, what to preach, they told me how long to preach, they told me when to stop, they told me not to give an altar call, and they told me to wear jeans and preach in a shirt without a tie. I was a little nervous. I walked into that meeting, I was behind the, the curtain, it was time to this conference in, in the Bronx, and I, I walked out and there they were. On a Wednesday night, the first night of the conference, about 500 young people, 500 young people, Hungry for reality and truth. And not one of them had on a necktie. Not one of them looked like I normally look. But they heard the word. And they're hungry. Man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. I say, let's, I say, let's reach Staten Island. All ages are welcome. Hello, all ages. All ages. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God which tries our hearts. And then there's good news in verse 13, for this cause, verse 13, for this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Would you pray a simple prayer with me this morning? Just take one of your hands and put it over your heart. Either hand will do it. You don't have to close your eyes. Just pray this simple prayer with me. Dear Jesus, speak to my heart. Change me 
forever. In Acts chapter 17, it records the founding of the church in Thessalonica on Paul's second missionary journey. He ministered there for a short time, and the Lord did a great work, but then Paul had to leave. He was unable to stay. They shuffled him out and smuggled out in peril of his life. Paul sent Timothy to see how things were going, and then he sent 1 Thessalonians from Corinth in response to young man Timothy's report. And Paul's purpose in 1 Thessalonians was to encourage the saints in Staten Island. How many of you know God had you in mind when he gave us the scripture? <laughs> There's 31,173 scriptures in your Bible, 1,189 chapters written by 40 different people in three different languages on three different continents over a 1,500-year period without contradiction. How neat is that? And there's one word that's not found written in your Bible, and that's the word oops. How many of you thank God he makes no mistakes? God knows what he's doing, and he gave the scriptures for you and me. He gave them to us for a purpose so we could what? So we could let him talk to us and change us. And in this little text, God gives us incredible wisdom to be a healthy, spiritually healthy person. How many of you want us to be a spiritually healthy person? I do, and God gives us wisdom. I just want to give you a few characteristics of spiritually healthy people. And we'll trust God that God will take his word and we'll, we'll allow it to marinate in our heart. And God can bring change where change is needed. I want, excuse me, but I want to be an anointed person, not to preach. I just want to be an anointed person. How many of you want to be an anointed Christian? What is the anointing? The anointing is the free flow of the Holy Spirit flowing through the life of the believer unhindered by an unyielded self-life. The anointing is not talent. It's not gifting. It's not noise. We had a preacher in Niagara Falls. He was preaching for us one Sunday. He goes, glory to God, you know I'm anointed. He was sweating. He was sweating profusely, and he made his announcement while he was preaching. You can ask my wife. I'm telling you, I'm not making this up. He said, you know I'm anointed because look at me sweat. I know people who sweat that aren't anointed. The anointing is the free flow of the Holy Spirit flowing through the life of the believer unhindered by an unyielded self-life. And God takes truth. He makes us healthy people so that we can make proper decisions, change habits, and God changes character. God gives us incredible wisdom in this little text for you to be a spiritually healthy person. I'll give it to you. If you have a pen or a pencil, just scribble down a couple things this morning. Here's my wisdom discoveries from our text. Healthy people, number one. Healthy people always look beyond the immediate. Would you say the word beyond? Paul said in verse 1, Yourselves, brother, know our entrance in, uh, unto you that it was not in vain. Not in vain. Did you hear that? How many of you ever wondered just how much good you were doing? How many of you ever wondered if you're praying or you're giving or you're serving or you're working or you're teaching is making a difference? The, the word vain here is the Greek word kinos. It means empty or failure. And Paul says, simply says in verse 1, our service to you was not in vain. It was not empty. It was not a failure. An enemy, in other words, it's obvious that the enemy was taunting Paul that he wasted his time in Thessalonica. The enemy insinuated that Paul was frittering away his time in serving God. The enemy tried to discourage Paul to drop out and spend his life on selfish, me-centered, narcissistic living on temporary gains. And the same fiery darts will come your way, friends. The Satan whispers to you, it's vain for you to seek first the kingdom of God. It's, it's vain. You're wasting your time spending time in prayer, getting wisdom in the word, paying tithes, giving offerings, witnessing to your friends, singing for God, leading worship. My goodness, you're wasting your time. Time, holding up your leader's hand, serving in the local church. Keep, why should you keep going when you feel like you're wasting your time worshiping God, reading good books, supporting missionaries, living in light of eternity? Are you kidding me? You're wasting your time living right while others party on with no regard for God. And God comes along and he reminds us of something very first in the first verse. Living for God is not a waste of time. Always look beyond the immediate. When you feel like it's not really working or God is not at work, 
and you can't see all that God is doing. Understand this. Healthy Christians understand this. You always, we must always look beyond the immediate because God is doing something right now even though you cannot see him. God is working right now even though you cannot feel him, some of you. God, excuse me, the earth is rotating on its axis at 23.5 degrees without your help. Aren't you glad of that? God's got it all together. God is doing something. And healthy Christians, healthy people, always look beyond the immediate. My second wisdom discovery is this from this context. Healthy people leave their baggage at the cross. Now let me just... Just, just get deal with it now and get it over with. We all have issues. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. You have issues. Yeah, I know you. We all, everybody knows you got issues. <laughs> I got issues too. Pastor already said I'm a friend. I'm not great. It's just this plain ordinary guy. I got issues. He knows I got issues. Oh, we got issues. We got, you know the person behind you has issues too, but we won't tell anybody, okay? We won't tell anybody. We won't even look at it. We would never embarrass the guy with the glasses, beautiful little goatee. We would never. No, we all know. How many of you know we're, how, excuse me. Look what Paul said. He said, we previously suffered and been insulted in Philippi, as you know, but with the help of our God, look at verse 2, we dared to tell you the gospel in spite of strong opposition. He said, I've been insulted and suffered in Philippi, and insulted and suffering are just two incredible words. But how did Paul respond to the abuse, the insult, the offense, the injury? He said, nevertheless, we dared to tell you the gospel in spite of strong opposition. Look in verse 2. He said, in fact, God helped us to continue to minister in spite of insult, suffering, Suffering, abuse, and opposition. In other words, Paul's painful, get this, Paul's painful experience in Philippi could have made him hesitate to minister in Thessalonica, and your past disappointments can make you hesitate to minister at ICC. But here's an incredible discovery from God to you in his word. Your past pain does not have to rob you of your future opportunities. Your past disappointments in Philippi have no power to keep you from the miracles in Staten Island. Your past offenses have no authority to make you critical, cynical, judgmental, and sour. Your past wounds and rejections were intended by Satan to sideline you, but God is using them to build you, to prepare you, to send you, to use you in ways you've never dreamed of. My friend, God uses broken people. God uses insulted people. God uses injured people. Humpty Dumpty fellow on the wall, off the wall, and hump, I forgot the story, but oh God put Humpty Dumpty back together. God has the power to put us back together again. My friend, only God can do that. How many of you know God does that? We didn't just sing a song. We just, we just declared that, God, how great thou art. God does that. Yeah, but you don't know how I was raised. Oh, God can overcome that. But you don't know my mother. Oh, God. Oh, please. God has a way. I love this text. I wrote myself a note here. Time doesn't heal all wounds. If time healed all wounds, God would be unnecessary. It's God who heals your heart with your cooperation. Paul said, I was insulted and abused and hurt and offended in Philippi. He's not bitter about it. He's just honest about it. Don't you love honest people? He's just reporting it. Why is he reporting it? Because God wants us to know something. What does God want us to know? That we can move on and don't have to live in the past. Mother Teresa said, give the world the best you have and you will get hurt. Give the world your best anyway. Eleanor Roosevelt said, people may wound you, but no one can destroy you without your consent. Stephen Covey said, if you do not transform your pain, you will surely transmit it onto others. 
And Oliver Wendell Holmes said, what lies behind us and what lies before us are but tiny matters compared to what lies within us. And the, the neat thing is, it's not what's behind you and it's not what's ahead of you, it's within. And the good news is God can change the inside of any person that wants to be changed. That's the good news today. We are changed from glory to glory, degree by degree, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. I love that. That gives me hope for me. It gives me hope for you. Hello? Turn your neighbor and tell him. Just let's just be let's just be honest. It's not next Sunday yet. But let's tell our neighbor. Let's just let's just be honest right now. Are you ready? Turn your neighbor and tell him. You're not don't tell him what I did, didn't tell you yet. Tell him what I tell. Turn your neighbor. Some of you are talking already. I don't know. What are you telling them? I haven't said anything yet. Just remember, I can read lips. Turn your neighbor and tell them, you're not perfect. And now tell your neighbor, and neither am I. And now tell your neighbor, we're all in process. And now tell your neighbor, God's going to finish what he starts in you. Hello, there's hope for everybody. God said in Philippians 1, 6, he'll finish what he started if you'll cooperate with God. Hello, God will do that. There's two choices when you go through what Paul went through. Two choices. You can run from God and claim that God isn't fair. That equals anger. You can run to God and find grace and help in time of need, and that equals joy. Anger or joy. They're the symptoms of a deeper cause. It's your choice, and it's my choice. Last year, we discovered that worry is accepting responsibility God never intended for you to carry. Last year, we learned that discouragement is a lie of the devil to blind you in the present of what God's going to do in the future. Last year, we learned that resentment is allowing someone you despise to live rent-free in the house of your mind. You say, oh, you, we don't need to hear that in church. Oh, really? I gave an altar call, and the guy stood right here, and he said, Pastor, would you pray for me? I hate my ex-wife. And he said, in fact, I hate her so much, if she was here today, I'd kill her. We just got finished singing, Kumbaya, my Lord, Kumbaya, oh, how I love Jesus, Kumbaya, pray for me, I could kill her, Kumbaya, are you serious? You mean I'm in the right place at ICC? You mean God brought me here today? To to go deeper into my heart and change what needs to be changed in me? You mean I got up early, I got cold, and I came here to hear the Lord speak to me from the scriptures that God could change inside of me what I can't change for myself? The answer is yes. Healthy people. Healthy people, just give me, give me, let me give you a couple more discoveries, maybe two more. Healthy people understand the principle of endurance. Would you say the word endurance? Endurance. endurance. Paul said in verse 7, as apostles of Christ, we, we could have been a burden to you. But we were general among you like a mother cares for her children. He, there's no more tender language that's than, than this. Look at this. It removes the right here in verse 7 to ever be harsh or rude to people. Remember, Paul's ministry in Thessalonica aroused some violent opposition and slander. And how did Paul respond? He retaliated by praying for his accusers. He refused to war with flesh and blood. In other words, Paul could have wielded a heavy hand of apostolic authority, but he chooses to be gentle as a mother holding a newborn baby. What's the revelation here? Spiritually healthy people have learned to bear with the weaknesses of others. True spiritual healthy people are patient as a mother is with a newborn baby. True spiritually healthy people are willing to endure for the sake of those they're serving. Paul said in verse 8, we don't just share the gospel with you, but we share our very lives as well. We don't just love the word, we love the people to whom we give the word. I wrote myself a note, vital Christian service will always be costly. 
Self-sacrifice lies at the heart of all Christian ministry. A true servant will endure much because they make themselves vulnerable. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 11.4, if you wait for the perfect conditions, you will never get anything done. There will never be a perfect time to reach this generation. There will never be a perfect, no, you, if you wait for perfect conditions, oh, when I, when, when I get a new job, then I'll start paying tithes. When God creates, when God creates 26 hours a day, then I'll, then I'll start my devotion. No, they'll, if you wait for perfect conditions, you'll never get anything done. There will never be the perfect time, the perfect day for you to ch prostrate yourself before the mercy of God on a day like today and give God the permission to go deeper and change inside your heart what only God can change inside your heart. I, loved, I love this, how Paul said uh, in verse 9, he said, Surely you remember, brothers, our labor and travail. Would you say the words labor? Yeah. Labor and travail. We work day and night, night and day, in order not to be a burden. I have, I, have, I, have, I have to make an announcement to you today. Superman is dead. That's just good Bible theology. There are no supermen here or women. Superman is dead. Because what Paul was saying here, he says when he says in verse 9, remember our toil and labor, the word for toil means fatigue, and the word for labor means hardship. And Paul's not complaining, he's just being transparent. In other words, he's saying it's possible to get fatigued, it's possible to get tired, it's possible to, to get weary in continual service for the Lord, it's possible to face some hardships along the way. My, my, the, the, the good news is this, the good news is this, that God knows who you are and where we live, and we don't have to fake it, we don't have to pretend. And hello, we can say, God, here I am. Pastor took me around this city last night, and we went by these homes that were devastated, and some had boarded up, and some had green certificates, and some had yellow certificates, and some were just crumpled up in a pile of, pile of debris, and, and some were missing, and there was piles of garbage here, and then there was tents over here, and we did the tour last night. And, 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 and I just have, I have good, I, I, the good news for, for you is this. We, we can be honest. Why is it so hard for people to come to service and be honest? I'll tell you why. One word, pride. We're concerned about our image. How you doing? Hmm. How you doing today? Hmm. He just got in the car, the little baby threw up all over you. How you doing? <laughs> you backed out of the drive, we ran over the mailbox, pulled back up and walked, ran over the cat on your way back. But how you doing? <laughs> oh, how you doing? You just got served papers yesterday. How you doing? <laughs> how you doing? No, oh, just, IRS just gave me a call. <laughs> oh, we just... Excuse me, Calvary only covers what we uncover. Calvary only covers what we uncover. To the degree that I can get away with something, to the same degree I can't be delivered from that something. I must come with transparency, honesty. So I have a question. Are you fatigued? Are you weary in your labor? Are you in a spiritual battle and you, you know that Satan is opposing your progress to hinder you from your fullest potential? We discovered yesterday in our leadership that two of the greatest freedoms are there's, when there's nothing to prove and no one to impress. Thank God. I, I'm so glad to hear your pastor say that only God is great. And today, that means that you can chill. Chill. That's right, chill. I didn't say chilly outside. It just chill. <laughs> chill. Just chill. Just chill. And give God the next few minutes to produce a heart in you that will accelerate 
your spirituality because the last thing Paul deals with in verse 10, look at this. He teaches me healthy people live holy through a repentant spirit. Would you say this word, it's biblical repentance? Would you say repentance out loud? Like, like just pretend you're singing a song on repentance. I know you never will. I've never heard a song. Like, let's just pretend. Ready? I'll be the choir director. Just call me Cliff Barrows. You ready? One, two, three. Repentance. I heard that. <laughs> Did you hear that over there? Repentance. Did you? Repentance. Are you kidding me? Paul said, holy, righteous, and blameless in verse 10. Look at this. The word holy means being set apart for God. The word righteous means to submit to the law of God. And the word blameless means without cause for reproach to those who watch us. What's that mean? That means we maintain a heart of repentance and an attitude which is a heart that offers no excuse for inconsistent behavior. Secondly, it's a heart that hates every sin that robs God of his glory. Thirdly, it's a heart that's easily convicted when it offends the Lord. And fourthly, it's a heart that confesses every disobedience that hinders our spiritual growth. Oh, and fifthly, it's a heart that never wants another person to stumble. I tell you, I almost fell off my seat this morning. I saw some, I saw some guy like, wiggle in here and he wiggled right out he had like 10 boxes of Kleenex I'm looking for one don't worry we're not going and he dropped all these Kleenex oh my goodness not even open yet and and uh and and I've had people say to me uh say uh, I've had people say to me Bill you cry too much and then I have to remind them that leaky heads don't swell Oh, you can have crocodile tears. We've all seen those, right? Like Esau, tears, tears were wasted, the Bible says. But genuine godly sorrow produces no regret, Paul said. Because true, true repentance, what? True repentance produces godly sorrow, and godly sorrow calls us to run from the thing that we're repenting of. I think godly sorrow is a wonderful thing. Being convicted is a wonderful thing. When God gets in my face, it's a wonderful thing. I love it when God shows me what I need to change because God loves me enough to leave me the same. And he loves you enough to wake you up this morning to bring you here and hear, you, hear me do something I'm not supposed to do. My son told me this just this weekend. said, when, Dad, when you preach, don't holler at people. <laughs> I'm not hollering at you. Don't tell him. Don't go on Facebook and go, Rob, your dad lied. He did holler at us today to, to Robbie Kirk. Don't, don't do that. I'm not hollering at you. I'm not hollering at you. I'm just telling you. Why repentance is so important. Because when you lessen the motivation for repentance, the tendency to excuse sin increases. It is only by continual repentance that the heart is made tender. Repentance frees us from carrying guilt that drains the vitality out of our life. Re repentance, without repentance you can't be free from sin, restored to God, and God's wrath abides on all those who choose their own way over God's Romans 2.5. says because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Remember, the more that I mourn over my sin, the more that sin loses its power to govern my life. I love this. I know what moralism is. Moralism says, here's what you're supposed to do. Now go do it. I'm not doing that today. Because a gospel-centered heart, grace approach, obeys God. Not because I have to, but because I, I have a desire to. And if I don't, I want to get a desire to. And I know something is God's desire for me. It's not to manipulate or leverage God's desire to accept me. So what's the real cause of disobedience? Carnal living or lack of spiritual growth. We forget the gospel of grace. Follow me now. Give me three more minutes. We forget what grace is. You shift your affection. You start trusting something else. You believe a lie that something is bigger or better or more satisfying than God. Thomas Chambers preached a sermon called The Expulsive Power of a New Affection. 
he states that change doesn't come from trying to get rid of the bad things in our lives. They're only expelled when something greater and more glorious captures our heart. If sin arises because we desire something more than God, how can we reverse the process and live free from sin's dominion? Great question. Here's how. Through repentance of every misplaced desire and affection so that God can help us do what? Three things. Make good decisions, create new habits, and build strong character. What's the key ingredient for power and obedience and joy? The key ingredients to all of it is repentance of sin and faith towards God. Thomas Watson said, Repentance is a grace of God's spirit whereby we are inwardly humbled and visibly reformed. How many of you want to be inwardly humbled and visibly reformed? Watson said true repentance from the Bible includes seeing our sins for what they are. Secondly, sorrow for sin that lingers and brings God grief. Thirdly, confession of sin that admits it specifically to God. Four, shame that causes us to blush and humble ourselves before the Lord. Five, hatred of sin to the core so that we can love Jesus all the more. And six, repentance is turning from sin and returning to the Lord. Now here's the neat thing. Why does God convict us and lead us to repentance? Why does God do that? Is it not because God's on an ego trip? Why does God do that? Romans chapter 2 verse 4 says it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. How many of you have, how many of you have children? Okay. How many of you love your children? Oh, some of you put your hands down already. Oh, let's, try, oh, wait. let's try that again. How many of you have children? How many of you love your children? How many of you know as children are growing, you have to hurt their feelings sometimes to save their life? Because the brain is not developed at birth, and you are their conscience. And God loves us enough to intercept us on the journey. He loves us enough to free us from sin and change us from the inside out. He loves us enough to confront us because you cannot change what you do not confront. Excuse me, what did we learn in 2010? In the deep water horizon drilling rig that spilled 40 to 50,000 barrels of crude oil into the Gulf Coast every day for nearly three months. What did we learn from oil spilling on 623 miles of shoreline globs of oil everywhere? What did we learn? We learned that the beaches were the what, but the well was the why. Excuse me, what good is it to go clean up the beaches unless you first cap the well? Repentance deals with the well, the source, not the what. It's the why. Rituals and resolutions can change our behavior for a while, but they can't change our hearts. Did you hear that? Jesus said sin comes from within the heart, external activities, resolutions, promises. Rich. I was convicted last night as the pastor was driving down some road. I, kind of a dichotomy. I think we were on this road called, is there a victory? Was it victory? We were on this like victory road? Victory Boulevard. We're on Victory Boulevard and we go buy a Dunkin' Donuts. I've made so many New Year's resolutions when it comes to Dunkin' Donuts. At the end of the year, God, this new year, I promise, I'm not because my cholesterol is so bad. God, I'm not going to eat any more French crawlers. God, I'm not going to eat any more eclairs. God, I'm not going to eat any more honey dip. God, I'm not going to eat any more chocolate glaze. God, I know them all. God, I, God, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I've made so many risks. And, and and then all of a sudden, January first comes, and it's the third day of the new year, and I find myself sitting in Dunkin' Donuts drinking a cup of Christian coffee. That's decaf, if you don't know Christian coffee. And I'm got and I got two French crawlers on my plate that just showed up because. The lady put him there for some reason, and I'm in. I'm taking the first bite, and I realize something. I am weak. <laughs> and I can't do this by myself. So as our brother begins to play, I have some questions for you. They're not outside-in questions, but they're outside-in questions because they're combined with God doing a work from the inside out. Changing your behavior doesn't make you a Christian, but becoming a Christian and repenting as a Christian changes you from the inside out. Again, your behavior in doesn't make you a Christian, 
but becoming a Christian and a committed, obedient, repenting Christian changes your behavior, but it's an inside out work. It's a work of grace. So let me just ask a few questions these last four minutes. Are you spiritually dry because your prayer life and your word life has been sporadic? Are you anxious and hurried because of misplaced priorities? Are you angry at anyone because they've hurt you in the past? Are you bitter towards anybody because there's someone you need to forgive? Are you allowing alcohol to destroy your brain cells? Are you allowing tobacco to steal oxygen out of your bloodstream and seven years off your life? Are you in a relationship that's not pushing you closer to Jesus? Are you allowing pornography to pollute your thought life? DVDs, movies, TV, internet, because your life will always go in the direction of your most dominant thoughts. Are you robbing God of his rightful place in your finances? Are you give, giving any evil reports about other people? Are you critical towards your pastor or any church leadership? Are you intimidating, rejecting, manipulating people who you disagree with? Are you addicted to anything that's made you a slave to it? Are you unwilling in your marriage or your family to say, I'm sorry, I was wrong, please forgive me? Have you lied to yourself about any of the above questions? Are you more concerned about what people think, your image, than what God thinks, your condition? Was there ever a time in your life when you were closer to the Lord than you are today? And are you willing to take a step this morning so that God can bring change where change is needed? If you want to be a healthy person, you will look beyond the immediate. You will leave your baggage at the cross. You will understand the principle of endurance and you'll live holy through the power of our repentant spirit. If you're here this morning and you know there's any, anything in your life whatsoever, large or small, that God's wanting to change and you're willing to give God permission before you leave, if that's you this morning, you know there's something inside your heart. God brought you here to hear the scripture. And you're willing to give God permission so that God can accelerate your spirituality and bring healthy, wholesome, positive change within your own heart. You're willing to give God permission to go deeper and bring change because you know there's something in your life that God wants to change. If that's you, would you slip your hand up, not to me, but to the Lord, the balcony and on the floor. Just slip it up to God. Go, just slip it up high to the Lord and say, Lord, that's me. And today, God, I'm going to give you permission. Let's all stand together, can we? Let's all stand together. I love ICC because of a lot of things. But one thing I like about this place, it's a safe place. We believe in the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Word, the power of prayer, but it's a safe place. And I want to invite you, every one of you that slipped up your hand before you leave, this will only take a moment because faith without works is dead. I want to ask every one of you that slipped up your hand to step out of your seat and come and stand across the front here, just across the front. No one's going to counsel you, yell at you, push you, shove you. No one's going to do any of that. I just want you to step out of your seat and just come and stand across the front on both sides. I want to pray with you and agree with you. I'm going to give God permission to go deeper before we leave. We're going to give God permission to expel the power of expulsion, to push out and give, and, and give us a greater affection for the grace of God. Because change doesn't come from behavior outside in. It comes from God replacing our affections, our misplaced affections. And God changes us from the inside out. But it's a grace approach. It's the grace of God at work. It's the grace of God at work. God bless you as you come. We'll wait for you. God bless you. Just step right into the front as close as you can. Make room for everyone. God bless you. I want to lead in prayer. I have nothing prescribed, but God will, God will help us pray together and believe God. How many people know that the Lord is here to answer prayer? How many of you thank God He is here? He rides into the heart, the human heart, on the wings of truth. Jesus said, "Ye shall know the truth, and truth frees us from ourselves. It's not yelling. It's not pontificating. It's not laughing. It's not screaming. It's not tears. It's not anything. It's truth that frees us from ourselves. Truth. You allow God's truth to penetrate your human heart. And God changes us and pulls down strongholds, mental, mental barricades and hurdles that, that, that God helps us to get over. And God, God does that. So I want to lead in prayer. And I want every one of you at the altar here to pray this prayer with me.